of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. It is good to be home. After three weeks in Sewanee, Tennessee, I was taking a doctoral class in liturgy in worship. It was lovely. There was prayer three times a day, and we had our windows open, yes, all day. It was very cool. And, and I don't mean like cool. I mean, it, the weather was cool. And, and the, the chapel bell would ring, and we'd have morning prayer. And then the chapel bell would ring for noon Eucharist and evening prayer. So we were just undergirded by prayer. There are 10,000 acres on what's known as the domain of Swanee. So the whole property of the University of the South uh, has 10,000 acres. And it wasn't until I got back that I heard that there is a tradition when students or professors or residents drive onto the domain, you rap on the top of your car to let your guardian angel know that it's okay, that guardian angel can take some time off. <laughs> because, because you are safe, and indeed there is a stillness and a presence of God there that was restorative and gave me energy to study. And then when you go off the domain, apparently, you're supposed to knock on the, the roof of your car and say you're back on duty. Well, if I'd just known that, I would have done it, and I wouldn't have turned on the news in my car in that 11 hours driving back home. And I had been insulated for those three weeks, and there, you know, I listened to the news, and there were things that brought me to tears, things that broke my heart, things that enraged me about justice. There was all kinds of stuff I was doing. I was like, what am I doing? Kind of halfway into my trip, I thought, I need peace. I had peace back there. How? do I have the peace of Christ back in my life so I can come back and share it? And I love our gospel for today because at the center of it, it's about having peace and sharing peace. Look on page four of your bulletin at the gospel of Luke. And down on verse five, you can see what the whole point is. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. So the gospel is about the Lord appointing 70 more people to send. He'd already done the little mission trip with the 12. Now he's appointing 70. And the point is to bring the very peace of God to prepare the way of Jesus who is heading to the cross. This is the section of Luke's gospel that is the journey to Jerusalem. Jesus is going to the cross because he is going to bring the peace of God to the entire world through his death and resurrection. And so I would think that for us, this story about the apostles being sent, 70 people being sent and appointed, um, can give a good pattern on how we can have that peace in our lives, how we can share it, and how it can abide consistently. We don't lose that peace. If we look, we can see that peace of Christ happens in relationship. It happens in relationship, it's shared in relationship. We can expect that it brings restoration, but in order for it to continue with us, to abide with us, we have to have the right motivation. So let's look at this gospel and see the aspect of relationship. Um, first of all, with whom is he appointing and sending these 70 people to share the peace of Christ? Let's look at verse 1. The Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs. 70 is an important number in the Hebrew scriptures. If you go to Genesis 10, you have what's known as the table of nations. How many nations that will populate the world do you think are listed in Genesis 10? 70. You get, you get an A plus for Sunday. 70. So that's the first clue to us that what Jesus does and what Jesus gives us is for the entire world, for us to share with the entire world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And indeed, the earliest Christians experienced this. The, the gospel, the peace of Christ is not just for a certain people that do a certain thing. Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, it says, God desires all people, everyone, to come to the knowledge and love of God. 
So how is it shared? Well, we hear he sends them in pairs. This is not a Lone Ranger religion, is it? It's not just about me and God, and I got right with God, so I'm at peace, so I can sit at home and put my feet up. This is about being in relationship. And indeed, this is where it starts. This is where peace starts. It starts in worship, when we receive the word of God, the very life of God in the sacrament, but it also happens in a relationship of prayer with another person, with other people who are believers. Uh, Look what he says in verse, uh, verse 2. He said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. He's telling those people that he is sending to pray for one another, to pray with each other that they will be sent, that they will be equipped with the peace of Christ to give to those whom they encounter. So it's about relationship, and one of the biggest gifts we can give to ourselves that God provides, that we can accept from God, is a spiritual relationship. St. Allred said, he wrote a little book called Spiritual Friendship. He was in the 12th century, and he said, the most effective medicine that can soothe the soul and heal the person is to share one's troubles, one's burdens, one's dreams, and receive consolation from another friend in Christ. And we need that. We need to be built up with each other. We need to pray for one another because when we read the gospel, we see that it's not going to be easy. This is verse 3. Go your way. See, I'm sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Ooh, lambs in the midst of wolves. It's dangerous. You better be prepared, but don't bring extra stuff. Gardener, I know you're always prepared with a backpack with extra stuff, but Jesus is saying here that don't take stuff that will make you depend upon yourself, depend upon God, and depend upon one another, and be lambs. That sounds like we're supposed to be completely vulnerable, but actually what it means is we have to be gentle. Be gentle. In um, in 1 Peter, it says, always be prepared to give an account of the hope that is within you, meaning the hope in Christ that you have, but do so with gentleness and reverence. With gentleness and reverence, we're to be lambs in that we don't force others to think the way we think, to do the things we do. We make friends with people. We're gentle. And if we're asked, we give an account of the hope that is within us. And one thing we do need to be consoled about, it's not just up to us and our buddy that we take with us. Jesus says at the beginning, he sends them into the towns and place where he himself intended to go. Think about that for just a moment. Do you have somebody in your life that, that you worry about, that you're frustrated with, that, that causes you concern, that maybe they're not doing the things or receiving God's love in a way that helps them flourish? And you tried and you've shared your peace with them and it seems to not have worked? Don't worry. Keep praying for them because Jesus intends to go to them as well. Does that make sense? He, he sends us in the place he intends to go. So whoever we encounter, and that means everyone from that number 70, we have to know that it's not about us, it's about Jesus, and he intends to take care of them. So we're to do it in relationship and in, in prayer and in pairs, and we're supposed to invest in people. And, and stick with it. So, number five, verse five. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there that shares in this peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Don't go bouncing around, Jesus says. Remain in that same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide. Do not move from house to house. Meaning, if you don't like the person... <laughs> You don't get to go, I'm going to go share Christ's peace with somebody else. Stick with the people you meet. Stick with those you're investing in. 
And he says it again, eat what's set before you. I have a friend named Michelle, and with her kids when they were little, she would isolate this verse, put the dish down, and say, Jesus says, eat what's set before you. I think that, you know, that's a good, that's a good thing when you're trying to get your kids to eat their vegetables. But what Jesus is really asking those sent to do is something really messy. Because what is the risk as good Jews that they are running if they sit down and eat whatever is set before them? They might eat something unclean. They might eat something that makes them unclean in the process of making a friend. And this tells us that we're supposed to put people before practices. Oh, it's so tempting to have the pattern in our head that we think will save somebody, right? that we can fix them, that we have a plan. If they could just see what I see and they could do what I do, then they're going to be fine. Not, not necessarily, Jesus says. Sit with someone, listen to them, listen to God, and you will find a common ground. We all yearn for peace. We all yearn for that reconciling love of Christ and then it's then that we can begin to have a bond with each other. It's then that people's hearts are open. So let peop love people and let go of our agenda and, and stick with it. Uh, Paul was telling the Galatians in, in our reading today, verse 9, he says, So let's not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time. There's that harvest. We will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then... Whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those of the family of faith. In times that it, does it kind of seem like the world's going a little bit backwards right now? That we're going the wrong direction? I know it feels that way, but what does Jesus say at the end of this, at the end of this reading? I saw Satan fall. The victory will be won. What Jesus does in his death and resurrection, in his ascension and sending the Holy Spirit, equips us to proclaim the coming kingdom that is in the process of being brought to earth and in the fullness of time, all of creation will be renewed and everything, everything is brought under Christ's gracious rule. We hear that in Ephesians chapter 1. So what we need to know is that we don't have to make it work but that when we encounter affliction and a trouble and the world seems to be going backwards, that there are going to be wars and rumors of wars and sickness and affliction and things that make us seem like things are going the wrong way, but the victory has been won and we are going somewhere and Jesus gives us the power in every situation to make a difference. And we need to know that it involves health and healing. That's the second thing, restoration. Look at verse 9. I'm going to find it. Eat whatever is said before you. Cure the sick who are there and say that the kingdom of God is come near to you. When we pray thy kingdom come, it is happening bit by bit, and we get to participate in that redeeming work of Jesus Christ. And, and we get to announce God's kingdom. And that healing that those disciples were so joyful about, that the sick recovered, that demons submitted to them, that healing still happens today. And it's precisely in times like these, when things seem off kilter, when things seem to be going the wrong direction, that God shows up in powerful ways. Uh, during Father Chris's Urdu language service on Pentecost evening at 5 p.m., we had an international service. And we had people from all over the world. I'm not going to try. I tried last service to name where they were from. And I'm just, it was the 70 nations. Let's just say that. From all over the world. And right before we went in, we had someone say, will you anoint me and pray and lay hands over me? I'm not feeling well after the service. And I made a split second decision to do it during the service, thinking one or two people would come forward. There were 80 people in that service. And over 40 came forward. For healing prayer. This is the time when hearts are open. This is a time when the spirit works. So, and, and I got texts. We had healing at that Pentecost service. We're always to seek healing. It may not look like it 
we think it should, but we're always, always to seek healing. And there's something very interesting in this passage. Um, that healing takes part in, it takes its, it does its work in the person bringing the good news, bringing the peace of Christ. You know that funny little thing, like if they, if they reject you, shake the dust off your feet? You know, that's, that's a prophetic announcement against that town. That's a warning, like you're going the wrong direction. God loves you. We're not going to spend extra time, but know this, the kingdom of God is drawn near. But I think it can tell us something very important about our emotional and psychological health that the gospel works in us. Because if we have rejection in our lives, if people won't hear us, if we try to love them and we, we don't get the same love back, and we feel like that's all over us, and we don't shake it off, what happens to us? We start to resent. We become bitter. I think this gospel can tell us that God gives us a power in the spirit. If Jesus commanded, it, we can do it. If we ask him, shake it off. Shake it off and know that God will help you in, in feeling loved and feeling cared for. God will minister to you. Last week, Father Chris preached a sermon. Like, do you ever feel done? Like, do you ever feel done? And he talked about Elijah needing a, a nap and a snack and God ministering to him. When we shake it off and turn to God, then we become stronger in Christ and we can continue on our way. And then finally, there's this part about judgment. Woe to you. It's going to be worse to you, you town that rejected Jesus, than it was for Sodom. Did you catch that part? You wouldn't have if I had paid attention to the lectionary. They cut it out. I put it back in. You know why I think they cut it out? We don't want to think that God is mean, right? We don't think that we have a want to think we have a wrathful God. That's not what judgment is about. Our judgment is wrathful, but God's judgment at the heart of it is love. What parent doesn't warn her or his child that they're going the wrong direction? What friend, if you really love someone, say, I know you think you, you see straight, but you're going, this is a bad thing that's happening in your life. If, if you care about somebody and you love them, you say, you're doing things, you're rejecting the good things in your life that can compromise your full flourishing. That's what, that's what Jesus is saying. Warn them. And remember, he's going behind them. It sounds mean, but Jesus is following up with his saving mission, and he will take care of those people that we warned. Um, so God's judgment is love, and our motivation has to be in line. So it's relationship restoration, but it won't abide in our lives unless we have the right motivation. He says, don't rejoice that you thought you had this power over demons and you felt really spectacular like a spiritual rock star. That's not what this is about. Peace of Christ, the gospel, is not a possession that you wield to make things happen. You should rejoice that God loves you and it's pure gift. Your names are written in heaven already. You didn't do anything to earn it or deserve it, thank God, because that would be exhausting to try to please the living God. What Jesus will do will bring the kind of peace that makes you know God's love. So rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Don't, don't think that it is anything that you've done that, make things, that helps us. That helps us once again, that if we're success-driven, even about our spiritual friendships, about sharing peace with someone, and things don't seem to be working, that it is not about us, that it's about God's gift of grace in our lives, and that God cares for that person way, way more than we ever could. And that the peace of Christ only will abide in our lives, remain with us, to the extent that we share peace, no matter what comes our way, no matter what situation. Peace doesn't mean you're laying down and accepting abuse. Peace doesn't mean you're, you're, you're entering into things that aren't good for you. Peace means that you meet anything and anyone with God's love. And God's love is transforming. So it may seem these days like we're going the wrong direction. And we may lose our peace once in a while. But remember, that's our cue. That's our cue to reinvest in those relationships. 
with someone who's a strong believer that we can trust, who will pray with us and for, with, for us. And then if you are feeling sorry, if I'm feeling sorry for myself, my spiritual director always says, go out and help somebody. Get out of your own head, get out of your own life, and give, because when we give sacrificially, that's when there, that restoration happens. And we have the motivation to let that peace of Christ work in our lives because it's pure gift and we know it. Peace to you. Amen.